Okay, now let's talk about climate change. I think that it would be worthwhile at this introductory lecture to provide some definitions of key terms that we will be discussing throughout the summer semester. Now you've probably heard of these terms that we'll be discussing on this slide. We're going to talk about two of them first. But you might not have thought about exactly how to define them. Let's start with the first term, weather. How would you define weather? I want you to pause the video and come up with a one definition, uh, one sentence definition of weather, and then continue. Weather is the state of the atmosphere at a particular place and time, and it's highly variable, changing from day to day, year to year. Weather represents the here and now of the atmosphere. It just tells you what the atmosphere is like at a certain location and at a certain time. It changes from second to second sometimes, hour to hour, day to day, month to month, and year to year. You see that it's local in a temporal sense and it's small scale in a geographic sense. What about climate? How would you define climate? Again, pause the video and come up with a one-sentence definition of climate. Climate, on the other hand, is the accumulation of daily or seasonal weather events over a longer time period. It represents a long-term average of weather, but it does, have, it does have to include the extremes. Climate is longer scale than weather in a temporal sense. Okay, weather specific to a certain time, whereas climate is over a longer time period. And climate is generally more geographically broad as well. Weather is more local to a place. Climate is more um, deals with a uh, region. Now it does represent a long-term average or in a statistical sense mean of weather but it does still have to include the extremes, the record highs, the record lows, record precipitation events. How about meteorology? How would you define meteorology? And how would you define climatology? Meteorology and climatology represent the study of weather and climate, respectively but they are each components of atmospheric science and are dealt with in this course. So, meteorology does not study meteors, it studies weather. It still happens where I'll tell people that I've studied meteorology and they start asking me questions about astronomy, okay, questions about space, mentioning meteor showers, okay. So the meteor in meteorology doesn't refer to meteors from space, it actually refers to hydrometeors, which in a general sense are falling particles from the sky, such as raindrops, snowflakes. Um, climatology, on the other hand, has a more intuitive definition. It's the study of climate. Now, both meteorology and climatology are looking at atmospheric science. They're studying the science of our atmosphere, that thin layer of air that contains the oxygen we breathe, the weather that we experience, it also protects us from the onslaught of space material and debris. The difference between meteorology and climatology is the scale of time at which they study. Okay, meteorology looks more at wet, uh, the atmosphere at, uh, at a specific time, short-term time, whereas climatology looks at the atmosphere over a longer time period. Now, what types of variables does weather include? Think about what you could talk about to describe weather, okay? If someone asks you what the weather is like today, what comes to mind? Well, perhaps the most obvious variable describing weather is temperature, how hot or cold it is. We can give the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit or in most of the world degrees Celsius. Of course, temperature is important because it helps dictate what we wear, how we dress, okay? It also can affect our energy level, our diet. 
Relative humidity describes weather. It's basically a measure of how close the air is to being saturated. The higher the relative humidity, the greater the percentage of air that's, um, or the greater to, uh, percentage of capacity there is with holding water vapor. So relative humidity has a range from zero to 100%. To help you remember that, just think of Drake's song, zero to 100. If the relative humidity is zero percent, it means that the atmosphere is zero percent to capacity with water vapor. Basically, it doesn't have any water vapor, okay? It would be bone dry, and that's very rare. Even in deserts in the summertime, and above dry regions, there's usually at least a little bit of water vapor in the atmosphere. On the other hand, if the relative humidity is 100%, it means that the air has as much water vapor as it can hold at that temperature. Okay, it's completely maxed out with water vapor. Now, relative humidity is actually affected by temperature. The higher the temperature, the more water vapor the air can hold. So a relative humidity um, will change, actually, if temperature changes, even if the amount of water vapor doesn't change. So at nighttime, typically relative humidity increases because the temperature cools as the Earth loses heat to space, so the capacity of the air to hold water vapor goes down, and so that causes relative humidity to increase. Conversely, during the day, the incoming sunlight warms the surface up, the capacity of the air to hold water vapor increases, and actually the relative humidity, which is the content to capacity ratio, it tells you what percentage the air is to, to capacity of water vapor, goes down. Now, wind, of course, describes the weather. And what are the two components of wind? Well, we have wind direction telling you where the wind is coming from. Wind, of course, is the motion of air. And in meteorology, we describe wind direction not by the direction the wind is blowing to, but the direction to which the wind is coming from. So, for example, a south wind would be coming from the south, blowing to the north, not blowing to the south. And the other component of wind is wind speed. When speed describes how fast the air is moving. We typically look at wind speed, at least in the United States, in miles per hour, in generally, um, for most people. Although, for mariners and meteorologists, they may look at the wind in knots or nautical miles per hour. Can you think of any other variables describing weather? We have cloud cover, which basically tells you the percentage of sky coverage by clouds. If there are no clouds in the sky, we can say that the sky is clear. And in the daytime, we can also call that sunny. Of course, we can't say it's sunny at nighttime when the sun's below the horizon. If the sky is 100% covered by clouds, we say that the sky is overcast. Of course, the sky, part of the sky may be blue, part of it may be covered by sky, uh, clouds. So the cloud cover can vary, actually, anywhere from zero to 100%. It doesn't have to be at one extreme or the other. Climate represents a broad average of the weather for a region over a much longer time scale than weather. Decades, centuries, millennia. Decades means tens of years, centuries refers to hundreds of years, and millennia refers to thousands of years. So when discussing climate change, one must be looking at a long time scale. One cannot simply look at a few years of temperature data for the world and come up with a statement that there's global cooling or global warming. Sometimes the skeptics will try to argue that the Earth is cooling by looking at a few years of data, seeing that the planet's temperature decreases from one year to the next, or from one year to the following couple years. 
But remember, when you're discussing climate, you need to be looking at at least decades, tens of years of data. So when you're talking about climate change, you can't look at a few years of data. You need to be looking at how the climate has changed over decades, centuries, millennia. Now let's talk about an example of a climate. The Earth is very vast. There's many types of climate. Um, and we want to talk about the characterizations of a certain climate. And we'll be talking about them. And then we'll be looking at data to support them. So let's start with a Mediterranean climate. A Mediterranean climate is characterized by relatively hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. So it's fairly hot and it's fairly dry. It doesn't rain or snow much in the summertime for a Mediterranean climate. And if a region has a Mediterranean climate, it's cool, not super cold, but cool and fairly wet in the wintertime. Well, Sacramento, California, our state capital, is a city with this particular climate. If you've ever been to Sacramento for an extended period of time or lived there, you're probably familiar with it being uh, fairly dry in the summer, it doesn't rain much, and it gets pretty hot. Um, and in the wintertime, it's fairly cool and wet. Now, if you haven't been, famil um, haven't been familiar with this, or let's say you don't want to just take my word for it, we can look at data to support the fact that Sacramento has a Mediterranean climate. So here on this slide we have two figures. We have a figure on the left here and this figure on the right. Now it's very important when you're analyzing figures to understand them well and look at the uh, information that describes them. So you want to always look at the figure captions to help you make sense of them. On the left, what do you see? Well, look at this vertical axis or in math y-axis. We have values of degrees F. So what should come to mind? Degrees Fahrenheit. We're looking at temperature. And on this horizontal top axis or in math we call it the x-axis, we have three letter abbreviations, Jan, Feb, Mar. You can probably put together what you're looking at. You're looking at the months of the year. There's 12 months in the year. Hopefully we all know that. So you see we have each month of the year laid out here and we have a temperature value for it. Now in this figure we have these orange circles for each month of the year and blue circles for each month of the year with numbers inside the circles. If you go down here, you see this temperature legend with average high and average low selected. So we're looking at average high in orange and we're looking at average low in blue. We're kind of a turquoise green, depending on uh, your perception. On the right, what do we have? Well, you see again a horizontal axis with months of the year. So we have our 12 months of the year. This time on the vertical axis, we're not looking at values of degrees F for temperature. We're looking at IN, inches of precipitation. See how average precip is selected here. So this data actually comes from weather.com and it's the Weather Channel website. Of course, you're familiar with the Weather Channel if you ever watch the local forecast or if you have the app on your smartphone. And this data is climatological data. It's based on 30 years of weather records for Sacramento for the period 1981 to 2010. So remember, when we talk about climate, we are talking about um, a time scale of at least decades. So what was done was the weather data for Sacramento was examined over 30 years from 1981 to 2010. And then climatological averages were calculated. So. To start off here on the left side of this figure, this 54 represents the average high temperature for January in Sacramento based on that 30 years of data. The average high in January in Sacramento, 54 Fahrenheit. The average low in January in Sacramento, 41 Fahrenheit. 
So, it should make sense that in the summertime, it's, it's hot, the temperatures are highest because the days are long, longer than in the wintertime and the sun's higher in the sky. Okay. Um, now, let's come back to our Mediterranean climate. We said it's characterized by relatively hot, dry summers and cool, wet winters. Well, let's look at our summertime temperatures in Sacramento. Summer in the northern hemisphere begins on the June solstice, usually June 21st or 22nd, and it ends on the September equinox, September 21st or 22nd, depending on the year. It can vary a little bit. So the two months of the year that are completely encompassed by summertime are July and August, and not surprisingly, those are the two hottest months of the year for most locations in the northern hemisphere. We can see that for Sacramento. Those are the two months with the highest average temper monthly temperatures. The average high temperature for the month of July in Sacramento is 93 Fahrenheit, and the average high temperature for the month of August in Sacramento is 92 Fahrenheit. I think you could agree that's relatively hot, okay? High temperatures on average in the late afternoon in the low 90s. Now it cools off at night, thankfully, to the low 60s on average. One nice thing about Sacramento is that even though it gets hot there in the summertime, it will cool off at nighttime. For much of the country, especially places in the northeast, in the south, and the midwest, it stays warm at night. So that can make it hard to sleep because the temperatures don't really decrease at night. So, we have our relatively hot summers. We also said the summers are dry. If we come here to this figure showing our monthly average precipitation, and we look at the two months that the summer completely encompasses, July and August, what do we see? That they're bone dry. July has er, nada, zero inches of precipitation on average. And August has just 0.03 or three hundredths of an inch of precipitation on average in Sacramento. Many years, Sacramento doesn't get any measurable precipitation in July and August. Occasionally, though, monsoonal moisture from the Mojave and Sonoran deserts makes its way up into Northern California. And every few years or so, there can be a thunderstorm, even a couple thunderstorms in Sacramento in the summertime, which can quickly drop rain. And especially, the rain can add up if they stall over an area and don't move. But for the most part, you could definitely agree it's very dry in the summertime in Sacramento. So we're, we see evidence for hot, dry summers. Now, we also saw the Mediterranean climate is characterized by cool, wet winters. Well, let's look at our temperatures in the wintertime. Wintertime in the Northern Hemisphere begins December 21st, 22nd on the uh, winter solstice, and it ends on the spring equinox, March 20th. So January and February are the two months of the year completely encompassed by winter. Although the meteorological winter is a little different than the astronomical winter. The astronomical winter begins in late December and ends in late March. But meteorologically, winter tends to be, include the months of December, January, and February, not March. Um, and it begins in December, even though the first few weeks, most of December is technically fall by astronomical standards. Because it turns out, as you can see here on this figure, December and January are two, the two coldest or coldest months uh, of Sacramento over the course of a year. And it turns out for most places, December is one of the coldest months of the year, even though it's, most of it's not technically winter in an astronomical sense. Um, regardless of the exact dates for winter, whether you're talking about astro astronomy or meteorology, you can see that December and January are the two coldest months of the year in Sacramento. And it's not super cold. Okay, Look at our high temperature uh, temperatures in December and January, 54 Fahrenheit. So that's not really that cold. That's cool. You definitely want to have on a sweatshirt, a hoodie, maybe a light jacket. If it's windy, a hat. And it does get pretty chilly at nighttime by us Northern California standards. Okay, 40, 
Fahrenheit low each day in December and a low of 41 degrees Fahrenheit in January. Now you would probably want to have a heavier jacket, a hat, maybe a scarf depending on your fashion sense, gloves too perhaps especially if it's windy when the temperatures get that low. So in the morning time you'd want to bundle up when it's cold out. But this is not dramatically cold like much of the country. Okay, By um, general standards this is relatively cool, not super cold. You notice every month of the year the average low temperature stays above freezing. A much different story for the eastern half of the country. But that's not to say that Sacramento can experience freezing temperatures. This gets back to our thinking about the difference between climate and weather. Just because the December average low temperature, average daily low temperature in Sacramento is 40 does not mean it's always 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, It doesn't mean December 1st, 2nd, 3rd of every year it's going to be 40 Fahrenheit at night. Some nights are colder, some nights are warmer. Remember, these are just averages. These are climatological averages. Okay, So in fact, Sacramento gets 10 to 15 days a year on average with temperatures below 32 Fahrenheit. Some years more than others, some years less. Weather is highly variable. changes from year to year. And Sacramento can also get triple digit heat in the summertime. Okay, typically about 10 to 15 years, uh, excuse me, 10 to 15 days a year with above 100 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. Actually, I lived in Sacramento for about a year and a half in the early 2000s, and I can remember numerous days with temperatures in the 100s, including a few days with temperatures of near 107 Fahrenheit, so quite warm. Now, thinking about precipitation which months of the year do you see the wettest conditions in other words which month of, of the year have the highest precipitation totals well January is the wettest month of the year almost four inches of rain in that month on average February is a close second at 3.82 inches December is third at 3.46 inches so you see that the wettest months are winter time. Okay? March, which is mostly winter, the first few weeks, of course, astronomically, gets, still gets over three inches of rain. And then you can see a dramatic drop off in the average monthly rainfall in Sacramento from March to April, from three inches to just over one inch. But it's fairly wet. You definitely see that most of the rainfall in Sacramento occurs in the winter time. In fact, if you added up all of these monthly average rainfall values to get the yearly or annual average rainfall, you'd see 20, it's a value of about 20.37 inches. During El Nino years, um, especially strong El Nino years, Sacramento may get 30, 35 inches of rain. Dur in the um, 2010s, 2011, 12, 13, there were some of those years Sacramento got less than 10 inches of rainfall. Okay, of course we know all about the drought in Sacramento, uh, in Sacramento as well as California. But of the 20.37 inches of annual average precipitation in our state's capital, 70 percent, over two thirds, falls in just the four months from December to March, which encompass winter completely. So most of Sacramento's rainfall occurs in the winter months and that's pretty um, uh, common to see not just in Sacramento but in the Bay Area in the uh, extreme Northern California Southern California as well exception some parts of Southeastern California get noticeable rainfall in the summertime due to the monsoon but hopefully you can see relatively hot dry summers and cool wet winters in Sacramento supporting the Mediterranean climate characterization for it. Let's talk about some more definitions. How could you define a hypothesis? Well, in science, a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a phenomenon or some observation. 
It's a statement or set of statements put forth to try to explain something you see. It might or might not be true. A theory, on the other hand, is a logically self-consistent explanation describing the behavior of natural phenomena originating from some observations. A theory is a proven hypothesis. It's been tested against reality, and so far it's passed all of the tests. Now this definition of theory in science is much different from the way theory, that term is used, in a colloquial sense. In a colloquial sense, the word theory is used to mean an idea that may or may not be true, but a scientist refer, referred to this as a hypothesis. When a scientist uses the word theory, she or he means a hypothesis which has been tested and so far has passed all of the tests. Again, a theory in science is a proven hypothesis. So, in everyday conversation, you may have heard of a statement like this. I have a theory that, or I have a theory because, that says, and it might be a way to explain a pattern, an observation, but you're not sure if it's true yet. Okay? In science, that's hypothesis. Now, the theory, which is the proven hypothesis, does not have to be valid forever. It is possible that the hypothesis gets tested and, been, and proven true, so it's a theory, and at some point, an experiment may happen that shows the hypothesis no longer is self-consistent, no longer is it uh, true, and that which case the theory would then become a hypoth hypothesis. Here's a couple examples of scientific theories. We have Einstein's theory of relativity. We have the Big Bang Theory, not the TV show, but the theory used to describe how our universe formed. Einstein, of course, the great scientist, one of the greatest scientists, smartest people who ever lived, well, he proposed his theory of relativity. He determined that the laws of physics are the same for all non-accelerating observers and that the speed of light in a vacuum, empty space, not the thing that you use to clean your floor, was independent of the motion of all observers. This was the theory of special relativity. He published his theory of relativity in 1915. E equals mc squared came out of his theory of relativity. Now, the Big Bang Theory, on the other hand, says that the universe began 13.6 billion years ago. The universe is quite old. And it says how the universe formed is that the universe, which is incredibly, unimaginably vast, filled with multiple solar systems, galaxies, stars, you name it, was contained in a point. And then a large explosion happened, a big bang happened, and it caused the universe to start expanding. The galaxies, the stars, the planets, they all started coming farther apart. Well, both of these theories have been tested and so far proven to be true. So that's why they are still theories today, not hypotheses. As an example for proof of the big bang theory, astronomers with telescopes, are able to determine that, in fact, the universe is still expanding. Matter in the universe is becoming farther apart over time, which supports the idea that initially the universe was contained at a point and an explosion happened and materials started moving farther apart. Let's talk about some more definitions. How about climate change? We're going to be talking a lot about in this, that in this class, right? Of course, the title of the class is Global Climate Change. How would you define climate change based on what you know now about the differences between weather and climate? Climate change represents changes in climate of the past, present, or future associated with natural or anthropogenic factors. And another way of saying anthropogenic is human-induced. So there's a lot to this definition, so let's examine it in more uh, detail. 
part by part. So it refers to how climate, the long-term average of weather, long-term state of the atmosphere, is changing either in the past, which would be the last 4.6 billion years, because the Earth's 4.6 billion years old, present, which is now, or future, in the years ahead, associated with either natural or anthropogenic factors. There's a couple different types of mechanisms that can cause climate to change. Natural factors, which are not human-induced, they are not caused by humans. Humans have only been around on Earth in the current form for about 200, maybe 250,000 years in the form called Homo sapiens. And the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, so humans have only existed for a small fraction of Earth's history. The Earth's climate has changed a lot in the past before humans were around. Can you think of some natural forcing factors that can have caused climate to change? The sun is not always the same intensity. Of course, the sun emits radiation, and the sun is the source of energy on Earth. Without it, we'd, there'd be no way to survive at our current capacity. It would be way too cold. Well, the sun's output doesn't always remain the same. Sometimes the sun emits more energy than other times. You might have heard of sunspots, solar flares. These are um, examples that show that the sun is not always emitting the same amount of radiation. When sunspot activity is high, sun emits more radiation. There's also volcanic eruptions. Volcano erupts, if you've ever seen pictures of it, you know that it can emit ash, dust, clouds, and that material can reflect sunlight. Volcanoes also emit carbon dioxide, an important greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. What about anthropogenic factors? Can you think of how humans are causing climate to change? Anytime you hear the word anthropogenic, it means human-induced, and you'll hear about it a lot in this semester. Well, humans are burning fossil fuels. There's three main fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. And humans burn them to generate energy. We burn them to generate energy for electricity, to power the lights on at home, to power your computers on, to look at this lecture, to power your TVs on, to watch games and play video games, whatever you do, watch movies, Netflix. Humans also burn fossil fuels for transportation energy. To drive our cars, we need gasoline or diesel, mostly. We are starting to see alternative energy sources for transportation, like electricity, ethanol, but by and large, most of the uh, energy for transportation still comes from burning products made from oil. Oil is one of the fossil fuels. Diesel and gasoline even used to drive and also jet fuel for planes are both made, is uh, made from oil. Humans also burn fossil fuels for agricultural purposes. For example, pesticide use, irrigation, fertilization involves burning of fossil fuels. Humans also burn fossil fuels to make products. In fact, Many products are made from burning of oil, for example, plastics, perfume, toothpaste, basketballs, stereos. And when you burn fossil fuels, it puts greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere. What's happened over time is that the Earth's greenhouse effect has become stronger. Global warming is a result of the enhancement of the greenhouse effect. And I know we're covering a lot of detail, but don't worry if you don't get it now. We'll be spending a lot of time going into, um, going into these topics throughout the class. Global warming specifically refers to the warming of the 20th and 21st centuries, in other words, the 1900s and into the early 2000s, associated with anthropogenic activities. 
from 1915 to 2015, the Earth's average surface temperature went up almost 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you may ask, what has caused this warming? Well, there's very strong consensus among climate scientists that most of this warming is human-induced. It's caused by humans. Despite what you, you may have heard in news, um, there's very strong consensus on the fundamentals. And throughout the class, we'll be looking at data not only showing that the Earth's planet has been warming up since the early 1900s, but we'll be looking at evidence connecting humans with our changing climate. So this is a preview of things to come. Now in this class, we will be using units. We've already been talking about units. We've been talking about degrees Fahrenheit for temperature. We've been talking about inches of precipitation. And we'll be using both metric and English units. Most of the world uses the metric system for measurements. United States, along with two other countries, Liberia in Northwest Africa and Burma, also known as Myanmar in Southeast Asia, are the only three countries in the entire world that still use the English system as their official system for measurements. Most of the world is on the metric system now. Um, of course, the world has a lot of countries. There's probably 300 or so countries in the world. So a very small percentage of the world still uses the English system as their official system of measurements. And in science, when information is shared between nations, units are important. And in science, metric units are usually used. It's important to be familiar with units in both the metric and English systems. And most important are to understand the different units for temperature and distance. Temperature We've been talking about in terms of degrees Fahrenheit, which we use for temperature in America, along with those other two countries. But most of the world uses degrees Celsius or degrees centigrade. Um, if you ever watch weather report for a country overseas, you'll see them discussing high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius. Likewise, if you ever look at um, odometers, speed limit postings overseas, you'll see a different unit than what is seen in America. So like in other countries, weather reports are given with high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius as opposed to degrees Fahrenheit in America. The distance units are also different. Most of the world's odometer, cars, odometers, and speed limit signs are posted in kilometers per hour, not miles per hour. It's important to be able to convert between these units. So first of all, how do you convert between distance? Well, there's 1.6 kilometers in one mile, and there's 0.62 miles in one kilometer. If you've ever ran a 5K or a 10K, you may be familiar with converting between kilometers and miles. A 5K is 5 kilometers, it's 3.1 miles. So to convert between kilometers and miles, what you do is you take your kilometers and you multiply it by 0.62 miles per kilometer. That's how you convert between kilometers and miles. Your answer for miles should be a smaller number than what you had for kilometers. If you want to convert from miles to kilometers, you take your miles and multiply by 1.6 kilometers per mile. Your number value for kilometers should be larger than your number value for miles. So those are some clues to help you see if you're on the right track. Converting between Celsius and Fahrenheit or vice versa is a little more complicated, but still straightforward enough. Here's how to convert between Celsius and Fahrenheit, from one to the other. Celsius to Fahrenheit, what you do is you take your degree Celsius, you multiply by 9 fifths, or 1.8, and then you add 32. 
if you're given a temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and you want to convert to degrees Celsius, you take your temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, you subtract 32. Then, once you do this, you multiply the remaining answer by 5 ninths. It's important to remember the order of operations when you do these temperature conversions. Let's look at a couple examples to get some practice with units. Number one, the average high temperature for July in San Jose is 82 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the value of that temperature in degrees Celsius? Now, just for your information, this average high temperature for July in San Jose comes from the San Jose International Airport data. You may be thinking, that seems a little cool for the average high temperature in July. I'm used to it being warmer. And that's certainly true in much of San Jose. East San Jose, South San Jose, for example, are both farther from the bay, the water, than San Jose Airport. And the water has a moderating influence on temperature. So the outlying areas of San Jose, further away from downtown, and North San Jose especially, can get warmer in the summertime. Regardless, the process, procedure for converting from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius is as follows. You take your degrees Fahrenheit, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, and what you do is subtract 32, so 82 minus 32 is 50, then you multiply by 5 ninths. And if you do the math, you should get 27.78 Celsius. Now that number might not mean a lot to you. We are used to thinking about temperature in the units that we're familiar with. So you might have a feeling for 82 degrees Fahrenheit, fairly warm. You might know how to dress for that. But if someone tells you the, av the average high temperature in July in San Jose is 27.78 Celsius, that might not mean as much to you. But if you were raised in another country, that might mean a lot more to you than 82 degrees Fahrenheit. Because, remember, most of the world uses the metric system as their official system of measurement. So that was a good example on how to convert temperature from degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. How about an example of how to convert distance? Well, let's have another example of converting from an English unit to a metric unit. California, the Golden State, population of about 40 million, is about 800 miles long from Oregon to Mexico. So if you drove along the coast on 1 or 101, depending on where you are, sometimes 1 and 101 are combined, all the way from the Oregon-California coast near Crescent City to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border near San Diego-Tijuana area, it's about 800 miles, okay? Um, you, could, you could do that in a, well, it would be pretty hard to do that in a day, to be honest. Now, how many kilometers is that? So what you want to do is take your 800 miles and multiply it by 1.6 kilometers per one mile. So 800 miles times 1.6 kilometers per one mile. And going back here, if you do the math, you'll get 1,280 kilometers. How about converting changes in temperature? Converting a change in temperature, a difference in temperature, is a little different than converting an absolute temperature. To convert a change in temperature from one scale to another, you only have to do the multiplication or division. You actually don't need to add or subtract. So remember how when you're converting actual temperatures between uh, the two scales, Celsius and Fahrenheit, um, whichever way you're converting, you need to add or subtract 32 somewhere along the way. You don't have to worry about adding or subtracting 32 when you convert a change in temperature. Here's an example. Let's say you have delta 2 Celsius. You might remember from math that delta means change in. So we're looking at a change in temperature of 2 Celsius. And I picked this example because it's very applicable to climate change. 
the goal um, in the world is to keep the 21st century warming below about 2 Celsius. Okay, The world is going to keep warming up in the coming decades. Um, the uh, amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is increasing rapidly at unprecedented rates, especially carbon dioxide, and it will continue doing so um, at least for decades to come. What we want to try to do is mitigate by reducing the magnitude of the warming. Okay, it could be a lot worse than 2 Celsius, but if the world comes together uh, as a whole, exchanges information, science, knowledge, and we really make an effort to switch from fossil fuel-based sources of energy to renewable sources of energy, we can keep that warming down to about 2 Celsius. How much is 2 Celsius in Fahrenheit? So what you want to do is take your 2 Celsius change and multiply it by 9 fifths, or 1.8. And you do that and you get 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit change, and that's it. You don't have to add 32. If you added 32, you get to that value, you'd get 35.6 Fahrenheit. And that should strike you as erroneous, okay? Uh, 35.6 Fahrenheit warming from 2000 to 2100, that's pretty scary, okay? Now, let's talk about more about temperature. Um, let's look at some well-known temperatures. And let's also talk about another temperature scale. Here on this figure, we have three scales of temperature. We not only have degrees Celsius in the middle and degrees Fahrenheit on the right, but we have what's called K, Kelvin. It's an absolute scale of temperature. And you'll know more about what why it's called an absolute scale of temperature in a minute. And here are some well-known values. The boiling point of water, or aqua, at sea level is 100 Celsius, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Probably know that, or you'll remember it if you hear it. When you go upward in the atmosphere, your elevation increases, your pressure decreases, there's, because there's less weight of air above you. And that actually changes the boiling point. But at sea level, and pretty close to sea level, it's about 212 degrees Fahrenheit. You may remember that average human body temperature is 98.6 Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. We are quite hot inside. And if the body temperature gets above around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when we start talking about having a fever. Of course, if you have a fever, you want to address that because it can cause you know, health effects. Likewise, uh, in, you will also want to address an issue if your temperature gets too low, if your body temperature gets too low, below 98.6 Fahrenheit. Average room temperature is 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 Celsius. Some people like it a little warmer in the low 70s. Some people like it a little cooler in the low 60s. I've read that the best sleeping weather is it's about 60, 61 to 68 Fahrenheit. Um, if it gets too warm, in your room at nighttime, it starts getting into the 70s, can, you can wake up. And if it gets too cold, it also can make it hard to sleep because your body gets too chilly and it wakes up because it's uh, too cold. Freezing point of water at sea level, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We were talking about 32 degrees Fahrenheit earlier. We were talking about Sacramento climate. If you have a liquid water and you cool it below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to start turning into ice cube. Or if you have an ice cube and you warm it up above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, it'll start melting. A bitter cold day here is shown as between minus 4 and minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. That's very cold, especially for us Californians. For us Californians, we might consider bitter cold day a day that doesn't make it out of the 40s. Okay, of course you know, temperature's perspective depending on where you've lived, um, how you're raised. Here's a couple temperature extremes. We have the highest temperature ever recorded in the world. The highest, warmest it's ever been in the world was 134 degrees Fahrenheit. And it occurred at Death Valley, California over 100 years ago in July of 1913. A skeptic might argue that this disproves global warming. 
They might argue that the warmest temperature ever recorded in the world was over 100 years ago. Okay, how can global warming uh, be happening when the hottest it's ever been was over 100 years ago? Well, we'll look at this. One day in July of 1913, with a high temperature of uh, 134 degrees Fahrenheit, is that climate or is that weather? Think about what we've learned. That's an example of weather. Okay, if you look at how the average temperatures in Death Valley have changed over the last several decades, you'd see that temperatures are increasing there on average. Okay, the lowest temperature ever recorded in the world was minus 129 degrees Fahrenheit. Pretty unimaginable, right? That occurred at Vostok, Antarctica, in July of 1983. And you might see that at first and think, well, how could that be in July? July is the warmest month. Well, that's July is the warmest month in the Northern Hemisphere. When it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere, it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. So hopefully that helps you understand that if you didn't already. A hot day could be in the low to mid 100s. Warmest conditions I've ever experienced were about 109, 110 degrees Fahrenheit in Concord, California in 2005. How about you? Anyone been in temperatures of over 110 degrees Fahrenheit? 115 degrees Fahrenheit? Maybe in Vegas, turn up, or maybe in Palm Springs? Um, I'm recording this on July 1st, and just last week, there were temperatures of 122 degrees Fahrenheit in Palm Springs, 126 degrees Fahrenheit in Palm Desert nearby. How about the lowest temperature you've ever been in? Now I have a question for you. We're talking about hot or cold. We know how the temperature dictates what we wear. But what does temperature mean physically? What does temperature mean on a molecular level? Think about that. And what does zero Kelvin mean? Well, temperature is actually a measure of the average speed of the molecules. It really describes how quickly the molecules are moving. So if you have, say, two glasses of water, and one's hot, okay, uh, maybe it's water that was just boiled, and the other glass is cold, it has some ice cubes in it, the, the, hot, the glass of hot water is obviously going to be at higher temperature and the molecules inside it are going to be moving faster than the molecules inside the water with the ice. The faster the average speed of the molecules, the higher the temperature. The slower the average speed of the molecules, the lower the temperature. Okay, if it helps you slow low. They rhyme, right? Um, I have a question though. What if you were going to cool something down? With it, you know, temperature not only can describe the air, a mixture of gases, but it can also describe liquid, water, it can describe uh, ice. What if you're going to cool the temperature of something down so low that the molecules stopped moving? They no longer were moving. They're still. Okay. What would the temperature be? It turns out that's what zero Kelvin is. Kelvin is called an absolute scale because it starts at zero Kelvin, which is the lowest theoretical possible temperature. Okay, we can't have a temperature below zero Kelvin because then the definition of temperature breaks down. And you can see this conversion that Kelvin is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273. You don't have to know that, that's just for your reference. So zero Kelvin is t minus 273 degrees Celsius, and that's about minus 100, 450 degrees Fahrenheit. In uh, labs, scientists have been able to get molecules down to within trillions of a degree ke zero Kelvin, but never quite all the way to absolute zero. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy in a substance. Again, how fast the atoms or molecules are moving. You remember from physics in high school or college, kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Okay. Now also, by the way, not all the molecules are moving at the same speed. Temperature tells you the average or mean speed of the molecules. Let's say you have a couple blobs or balloons of air. You have one of cold air and then you have one of warmer air. 
Now, air is, of course, a mixture of many gases. What is the most abundant gas in our atmosphere? It's not oxygen, which we know we need to breathe, but it's nitrogen. Of course, oxygen is very important to breathe. There's a reason why um, Everest summiters, people who hike Mount Everest, bring oxygen tanks. There's a reason why in the ocean, scuba divers bring oxygen tanks, right? It's hard. It's, you can't breathe water, right? You can breathe air, oxygen air, but you can't breathe oxygen in water. Um, now, the most abundant gas in the atmosphere is nitrogen, and there's about 78% nitrogen in air by volume. So if you're going to look at a volume of air, about 78% it's nitrogen. Then about 21% is oxygen. There's about three times as much nitrogen as oxygen. Actually, close to four times as much. So in these two bubbles of air, the green molecules actually represent nitrogen, and the red ox on, uh, molecules represent oxygen. Okay, Notice there's a lot more nitrogen molecules than oxygen molecules. And in the atmosphere, nitrogen atom gets lonely by itself. Okay, It doesn't like to be solo, so it needs a buddy, so it bonds to another nitrogen atom. Notice how you, you have these clusters of two nitrogen atoms together. That's diatomic nitrogen, N2. Likewise, oxygen atom gets alone, lonely by itself in the atmosphere. So it likes to bond with another oxygen atom. You have O2, diatomic oxygen in the atmosphere, shown by the um, clusters of the two red atoms together. This molecule here, you see these two little white spheres and the red sphere, that's water. Water's chemical formula is H2O. And actually, the water molecule looks a lot like Mickey Mouse. Um, now, here's our colder air. Here's our warmer air. What do you notice? What are the differences? What do you see as differences between the two blobs of air? Well, the warmer air blob is larger than the cold air blob. And the reason is because the warmer air blob has more, uh, higher temperature. I uh, didn't tell you, I should have told you earlier, there's the same amount of molecules in each blob of air. But because the one is warmer, the molecules in that one are moving faster, as you can see by these longer arrows behind them than in the cold air blob. So as the molecules move faster, they expand, and they require greater separation between them. Okay, let's start looking at observations of our changing climate. First, we're going to look at natural forcing factors. Here's an example. We have this creature, dinosaur. Is it a T-Rex? And we have what behind it looks like an explosion's happening. Well, look at that facial expression on the dinosaur. Okay. Look, so this, what do you think this is representing? It's representing an asteroid impact that occurred about 65 million years ago. And this is what probably wiped out the dinosaurs. There is an asteroid that uh, impacted the Yucatan Peninsula. Okay, And uh, what happened was a lot of ash dust was sent into the atmosphere after this impact and eventually it caused the Earth to cool. It's kind of interesting because you see the fire. Initially, it was very warm around the location where the asteroid made landfall. And then, over time, the Earth cooled because this material from the impact went into uh, space and reflected sunlight. Less sunlight came in, so the Earth cooled, and the dinosaurs could no longer survive. So this is an example of a natural forcing factor. Now, we're looking at global temperature change over the past 18,000 years. We have temperature change on the vertical axis. And what we're looking at is how temperature has changed over the past 18,000 years. And we're looking at, so we're looking at if it's warmer or cooler than now. If you see the, the red line gets above this zero degrees mark here, that zero Celsius, that means that that time was warmer than present. And 
if the red line at a certain time is below the zero Celsius horizontal dashed line. It means that temperature year was colder and by how much. So we're starting way back 18,000 years ago. 18,000 years ago was around the time of the end of the last ice age or glacial maximum. Back then, the what are now the polar ice caps, well, they extended into North America. Okay, They covered much of the United States. They also extended into Europe and Asia. Um, and so the ice began melting, and it slowly began warming up, you see, from the 18 to 16,000 years ago. And then the warming rate increased, okay, became a lot warmer quickly. And you, we reached this boiling alloroid period about 13,000 years ago, where it was almost as warm as now, see, just a little bit cooler than present. Then, what happened? Temperature cooled again. It warmed up a little. It cooled. It warmed up. And, it, and so you see some variation, warming and cooling over hundreds of years. And then you see a noticeable dip here. Around 10,000 years ago, it was about 3 Celsius cooler than now. The younger, driest period. Then temperature quickly increased again in the coming years. And over time, it became warmer until it got to the Holocene maximum around 5,000 years ago, when it was actually warmer than present. You see a decrease, and then fairly stable temperature from about four to 1,000 years ago to now. But then look at this. See this noticeable upward spike at the end that you can see even when you look back 18,000 years? That's the current global warming just in the past 100 plus years. So it's so dramatic, it's so, um, rapid that you can clearly see it even going back 18,000 years. Now you might be asking what caused these events. The, the uh, ice ages are generally um, affected by what, what are called orbital variations. The Earth is tilted on its axis, that's why we have seasons, and that tilt changes. The Earth orbits the Sun in an, in an ellipse, but the ellipse, it, which is a shaped circle, it's not always quite the same shape. Sometimes it's more elliptical, sometimes it's more circular. The Earth wobbles on its axis like a spinning top. And these orbital variations, which are not driven by humans, okay, they're, they are an example of a natural forcing factor. Okay, and they um, can be used to help explain some of these warm and cool periods over the past 18,000 years. Going forward, to the next slide. We're looking now at CO2 concentration on the top and temperature change on the bottom. CO2 stands for carbon dioxide. It's a molecule with one atom of carbon and two atoms of oxygen. And it's a very important greenhouse gas. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more, more of Earth's outgoing heat is trapped. So present is here at zero, and present being 1950, so it's not quite present, but in the Earth geolo uh, geologic sense it is, because Earth's very old. So 65 years, 66 years is not much compared to 4.6 billion years. You're looking at how CO2 concentration has changed going back 400,000 years. Okay? Now humans, if you remember, have only lasted for about 200, 250,000 years. So when we go back before 250,000 years, we're talking about before humans. And you see that CO2 varies anywhere from about 180 to 300 parts per million until 1950. Part per million is one in a million. You know how a percent is one in a hundred? Eighty percent means 80 out of a hundred, okay? Someone in the NBA shoots 80 percent from their the free throw stripe. They make 80 out of a hundred free throws. Well, one part in a million is one part in a million. It's a thousandth of a percent. So it's a very small concentration. If you had a million gallons of air, one part per million would mean one gallon out of those million gallons of air. 
So when you see a CO2 concentration of up to 300 parts per million, it means if you had a million gallons of air, 300 gallons would be CO2. So nitrogen makes up 78% of the atmosphere by volume. Dry air, that is. Water vapor is highly variable. 21% of dry air by volume is nitrogen. Only 1% then is left over. So gases like CO2, trace gases, CO2, carbon dioxide, methane, CH4, um, nitrous oxide, exist in small quantities. But don't be deceived. They are very important when we talk about climate because of their contribution to the greenhouse effect. When CO2 concentration reaches 300 parts per million, it means that that means that 0.03 percent of the air by volume is carbon dioxide. Now, if we go down to the bottom of the figure, we see temperature change from present. So we're looking at how the temperature is different going back 400,000 years compared to now, and what we see is that the temperature could be up to 3 Celsius warmer than now, or it could be 8 to 9 Celsius colder than now. Can you see any connections between the two plots? If you look at it closely, or if you look at it further back, to me it's pretty obvious there's a very strong correlation. When CO2 concentration is high, temperatures are high. When CO2 concentrations are low, temperatures are low. Okay, So they're correlated. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the warmer the temperature. Now the exact details of all the connections are, uh, not compl are uh, complicated, but there is a strong relationship. Now this data comes from the Vostok ice core. You might be wondering, how can scientists find temperature going back hundreds of thousands of years, way before thermometers, before even humans were um, around? Thermometers have only been around a few hundred years. Humans have, have only been around 200,000 years. Well, ice core measurements are an example of proxy data. Scientists can reconstruct a record of past temperatures by analyzing the ratio of isotopes in air bubbles. So inside of uh, the ice in Antarctica, there are trapped bubbles of air. And the isotopic fractions of heavier oxygen-18 and hydrogen-2 are temperature dependent. What is an isotope? An isotope is basically a heavier atom. Usually oxygen has an atomic mass of 16 because it has eight protons and eight neutrons. But there's a special type of oxygen called oxygen-18 that has eight protons and ten neutrons. The number of protons defines an atom, okay? So oxygen-18 still has eight protons, so it's still oxygen, but it has two extra neutrons, so it has an atomic mass of 18, so it's heavier. Protons and neutrons are what make up most of the mass or weight of an atom. Electrons the uh, other part of an atom, besides protons and neutrons, they're, they're pretty small, they don't really weigh much. And now hydrogen usually has one proton and zero neutrons, and one electron. For atoms, the number of protons and electrons balance. If not, you have what's called an ion. But there's a special type of hydrogen called hydrogen-2 that has one proton and one neutron, so it's heavier. There's a strong correlation between temperature and the ratio of the isotopes to their more common atoms. So if you look at the ratio of the heavier isotope to its more common form inside of the ice, that tells you about temperature. Very strong correlation. More information, you can look at the link below. Now, when snow falls in Antarctica, it falls on the previous year's snowfall without melting. Why? Because temperatures are below freezing year-round in most parts of the continent. 
you probably know that Antarctica is one of the coldest places, probably the coldest place on Earth, although parts of inner Siberia can rival it. It's quite cold there in the wintertime. Snow, deeper than about 80 meters or 250 feet, turns into ice from the weight above it. And in this ice are trapped bubbles of air. By drilling down from the surface of the ice sheet, a history of chemicals in the ice can be obtained. So what happens is the snow falls each year and so it piles up and so each year a new layer of snow falls on the previous years of snowfall and when the snow gets deep enough it gets crushed into ice from the weight of the snow above it. So you drill down in the ice sheet and the deeper you drill down the further back in time you go and you could drill down and go back hundreds of thousands of years, not just 400,000 years, even 800,000 years for some uh, ice sheets. And the isotopic ratios tell you about temperature. You can also look at the chemical composition of the trap bubbles of air, and that will help tell you about CO2 concentration. So this is just some information about how those measurements are made. So we looked at some uh, figures showing how temperatures varied in the past and the reason for those temperature changes were due to natural forcing factors. Now let's look more recent. Let's start talking about anthropo anthropogenic forcings and how climate will change in the future. Now we're going to start focusing more on global warming, a form of climate change that deals with how the planet's temperature has changed just in the past 100 to 150 years. Here's a brief history of global warming. Guy Stewart Callender was the first person to note a warming trend of our planet and associated it with fossil fuel emissions. And he proposed this in 1938, just before World War II began. That was a long time ago. He found a warming of 0.2 Celsius, or 0.36 Fahrenheit, from 1890 to 1935. So already, from 1890, before the 20th century, I think there's one or two, peop uh, two people still, born, still alive that were born in the 1800s. All the way from 1890 to 1935, long ago, right, before your parents were born, you know, maybe before your grandparents were born, there was a warming of 0.36 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it was a warming nonetheless over a 45-year period. So that's plenty of enough time to talk about climate change, right? Because he's looking at four and a half decades of data for temperature. And he found this for the globe. As a hobby, he scrutinized, analyzed weather observations from around the world. His father, by the way, developed the platinum resistance thermometer. And he proposed that rising carbon dioxide levels were mostly responsible. He proposed that increasing CO2 levels were responsible for more than half of this warming. So back in 1938, almost 80 years ago, okay, all of, that was the first time somebody, a scientist proposed that not only was the planet warming, but he also proposed th that fossil fuel burning, putting CO2 into the atmosphere, was responsible for most of that warming. Now at the time, his ideas were highly scrutinized. Um, back then, scientists believed that temperature data could easily be manipulated okay, to make your conclusions. He, his ideas were not well received at the time. Okay, they were very new. Okay, this was a very new development. Okay, not surprising considering he's the first person to note a warming trend and associate with fossil fuel emissions. Um, but over time, scientists became more receptive to his ideas. Keeling is famous for the measurement of carbon dioxide concentrations over Mauna Loa, showing a net increase over the past 50 plus years. These concentrations began in 1958. Mauna Loa, as you may know, is a volcano in Hawaii, on the big island where all the volcanoes are. Not many volcanoes on the other islands. Um, 
And the reason that the measurements of CO2 are made there is to get away from the hour-to-hour, day-to-day variations. You want to look at how global CO2 concentrations are changing. You want to try to isolate the measurements from uh, the day-to-day activities like commute hours and uh, uh, power changes, electricity demand changes in the course of the day. Try to get the net look. So there, I'm on low, it's far from the day-to-day, year-to-year, uh, excuse me, the hour-to-hour, day-to-day variations. And it's subject to strong prevailing winds, the trade winds. So it really gives you a nice chance to look at how CO2 concentration has changed over long time periods, years, decades. Mann and his colleagues, et al. means and others, in 1999 re- reconstructed average northern hemisphere temperatures over the past thousand years, past millennia, using both direct and proxy measurements. We'll be talking about what they are in a minute. And they found an increase of 0.6 Celsius, or 1.1 degrees Fahrenheit, from 1900 to 1998. This was a major development in the uh, global warming issue. They, they looked at uh, re- reconstructed northern hemisphere temperatures, where most of the world's land is, where most of the world's people live, um, going back a full millennia, back to the Middle Ages. And they found, basically in the 20th century, 1998, basically the 20th century, the northern hemisphere temperature went up over a degree Fahrenheit. Okay, This might not sound like a lot to you, but a small change in the global temperature can have great consequences, okay, as we will continue to see in the coming decades, and we're seeing already now, okay, the world is warming up, and what are some of the um, uh, consequences? Well, we'll be looking at some in the in the coming slides, such as sea level rise, melting of Arctic summer sea ice, decreasing snow coverage on Mount Kilimanjaro, okay, more forest fires, and so on. Now, what are direct and proxy measurements? Direct measurements are basically measurements of uh, temperature from thermometers. Okay. Direct measurements of temperature from weather stations around the globe have only been available since the late 1800s. Okay. Now, the thermometer's been around for a few hundred years, but only in the starting in the late 1800s were there continuous, reliable measurements of temperature from around the globe. Before that, the, there, were, there weren't enough continuous measurements and you, there wasn't global coverage, okay? You can't, you can't get a global temperature uh, value if you, if you only have, you know, te- uh, thermometers in, say, North America, right? You gotta have global coverage, okay? Good resolution throughout the globe to look at global temperature, right? So to reconstruct global temperatures prior to the late 1800s requires the use of what are called proxy measurements. We already looked at one type of a proxy measurement. Can you think of what it is? A way of looking at temperature before humans existed? Ice core isotope data. And there's others. Coral reef isotope data. Coral reefs, those very large ecosystems deep in the ocean. Or uh, uh, have isotopes, and the isotopic ratios uh, do tell you about temperature. And also, tree ring width can be used to determine temperature. Each year, a new uh, tree ring forms, and the thickness of the tree ring actually tells you about temperature for that year. This is the Keeling curve. Remember how measurements of CO2 concentration at Mauna Loa began in 1958. So you see this figure begins in 1958. And in blue you have the average um, CO2 concentrations for each year. In gray you have monthly values. So you see this oscillation, this wobbling in the monthly values. You might be wondering what is that? Is the data you know, uh, wrong? Is there an error in the data? It turns out that's uh, an effect of the seasons. During the springtime and summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, where Mauna Loa is, 
and in the northern hemisphere is also where most of the world's land is. The plants are growing and they're consuming carbon dioxide for, during photosynthesis to make nourishment for themselves. In the fall and the winter time, the plants decay, they die, they release that CO2 back to the atmosphere. Despite the seasonal variations, the net trend is very clear. CO2 concentration just keeps going up year after year after year. Some years more than others. Okay? But the net trend is very clear. When the observations began in March of 1958, CO2 concentrations were 315.71 parts per million. As of March 2016, CO2 concentrations are now 404.83 parts per million. That's a 28.2% rise in 58 years. Think back to the uh, temperature and CO2 concentration figure going back 400,000 years. And understand that before 1950, and understand before 1950, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere were never above 300 parts per million. Okay, going back 400,000 years, also going back 800,000 years. You, the, that wasn't shown, but you can also find data that shows going back 800,000 years, CO2 concentration was never above 300 parts per million. In fact, we have a slide later that will show that. And now CO2 concentrations are above 400 parts per million. This is unprecedented. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the stronger the greenhouse effect. Why has CO2 concentration gone up? It's entering the atmosphere at a greater rate than it's being removed. The increase appears to be, to be due mainly to the burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas. But deforestation also plays a role as cut timber, burned or left to rot, releases CO2 directly into the air. CO2 concentrations are currently increasing about two parts per million a year. Although in the last few years, they've been close to three parts per million per year. Now here's a figure showing temperature change in the northern hemisphere from year 1000 to 2000. This figure comes from the work of Mann et al. Remember how they found a northern hemisphere temperature increase of 0.6 Celsius or 1.1 degrees Fahrenheit? from 1900 to 1998? Well, this figure shows how global temperatures have changed, excuse me, northern hemisphere temperatures have changed from 1000 to 2000. Now, data from thermometers is shown in red. And you notice red only for 1880 to present. Okay, remember how the uh, uh, direct measurements of temperature have only been available since 1880. Before that, to determine temperature, what do we use? Tree rings, coral reefs, and ice, uh, ice cores. Now, the actual yearly temperatures are shown in blue, and what's shown in black is a moving average. It's basically a way of smoothing out the year-to-year -year variations to get more of a net trend. In gray, here you see this light shade of gray, that's uncertainty. There is more uncertainty with the proxy measurements than the direct measurements. You see the gray disappears as we get closer to present because thermometers are much more precise and accurate. The proxy measurements are good, but they're not quite as accurate as thermometers, so there's more uncertainty. What do you see for the net trend in global temperature from year 1000 to about 1900? It's pretty flat. If anything, it's a slight decrease, okay? And then what do you see happening from year 1900 to present? This noticeable upward spike in northern hemisphere temperatures. This figure is sometimes called the hockey stick figure because it looks like a hockey stick. By the way, in the mid-1400s, you see this dip in temperature. This occurred during the Little Ice Age. There were a lot of causes of the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age lasted in the mid-1000s, in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. There were different periods of it. It was associated with colder, the normal winters in Western Europe, North America, affected crops, affected people. And one 
explanation. One cause was more volcanic eruptions in the early 1400s, releasing a lot of ash and dust in the atmosphere, reflecting sunlight. Later on, in the 1600s, there was what was called the Maunder Minimum, an absence of sunspot activity that actually caused the sun to emit less radiation and it caused a cooler than normal climatic period. Let's move on to more recently. The hottest years are recent years. In fact, the global average surface temperature in 2015, last year, was the warmest since 1880. So the period of data from 1880 to present is, is sometimes called the modern meteorological record or the instrumental record. Modern meteorological record or instrumental record. It's how long we've had direct measurements of temperature from thermometers around the globe. And going back to 1880, 136 years ago, last year was the warmest ever. Now you might say, oh, well that's one year, okay? That's, you know, weather, right? Weather, um, can you see that the temperatures now are warmer than they used to be? Well, this is not a one-time event. If you want to look at the 10 hottest years in the modern meteorological record going back to 1880, nine of the 10 hottest years have occurred in just the past 14 years. So the nine of the 10 hottest years on record going back to 1880 have occurred just since 2002. The hottest years are recent years. The five warmest years were 2015, 2014, 2010, 2005, and 2007. I've been teaching global warming at San Jose State University since 2012, and I've had to update my slides numerous times to account for new the year, recent years, last two years, breaking the record for warmest year on record. And you may have heard this in the news, 2016 is extremely warm as well. I've read reports that there's a 90% chance, perhaps even higher, of 2016 becoming the warmest year on record. We are well on track to break 2015 as the warmest year on record. You can look at the uh, actual data here in the second link. You'll be doing that for a homework assignment. And you can look at the article uh, about 2015 being a record warm year in this link. Let's look at a figure showing the data, showing the recent warming. Here we have global temperature anomalies from 1880 to 2014. And so you have temperature anomalies, changes from the mean. An anomaly is a change from the mean, a departure from average. Okay. This figure shows how the mean or average annual global temperature for both land and ocean, the world is 70, covered by 70% water, right, 30% land, has changed from 1880 to 2014. And it shows temperature anomalies relative to the 30-year average for 1951 to 1980. Positive annual global temperature anomalies indicate that year was warmer than the 1951 to 1980 average, while negative annual global temperature anomalies, less than zero Celsius, negative values, indicate that year was cooler than the 1951 to 1980 average. The last year, the most recent year, with a temperature below the 1951 to 1980 average was 1976. Every year since 1976 has been warmer than the 1951 to 1980 average. So what happened to temperature from 1880 to 2014? We well, noticed temperature decreased from 1880 into the early 1900s and temperature kind of bottomed out around World War I. Then temperature began increasing. This is what um, Guy Stewart Callender saw, temperature increase. Okay. 
until you got to around World War II. Then you notice for a few decades in the 50s, 60s, 70s, not much change. Temperature began increasing again in the 70s. So what you have here, as the figure a caption shows, is annual mean anomalies in black, and it's a running average, a way of smoothing out the data in red. So you have these black tick marks or black boxes showing that year's average annual temperature anomaly and the five-year running mean in red. Which year out of these 135 years had the highest or warmest temperature? It's this one, 2014, followed by 2012. Excuse me, 2010. Now this doesn't go to 2015. This was an old slide before the 2015 global temperature anomaly got released. And I put, I keep the 18 to 80 to 2014 graph here to, because you really see the dramatic increase in temperature from 2014 to 2015. If you go from this figure to the one that includes the temperature anomaly for our planet in 2015, check this out. Boom. 2015 was off the charts, okay? Notice 2014 was just a little bit higher than, you know, 2010, but 2015 is just off the charts, okay? It's much warmer than, uh, relatively warmer than any other year going back to 1880. Now, Mount Pinatubo erupted in the Philippines in 91, before a lot of you were born, and this caused a global temperature decrease of 0.2 Celsius the following year. Here's 1991, and then look at how temperature dropped to the next year. What could the skeptics say? Oh, global cooling. Well, that's only a year of data. Temperature remained cool the next year, and then increased again. What happened was Mount Pinatubo erupted and made a lot of ash, dust into the atmosphere and reflected sunlight. How can we determine if there's global warming using this figure? We gotta be looking at how temperatures changed over decades, centuries. And it's very clear that the warmest years going back over a century, 135, 136 years, that's 13 decades. The warmest years have occurred recently. Okay, nine of the 10 warmest years have occurred just since 2002. To me, it's very clear of the warming. Also, what you'll notice if you look closely, is that temperature has been increasing faster in the last few decades compared to how it increased in the early 1900s. The slope is higher now. Here are some specifics on the recent warming values. From 1915 to 2015, 100-year period, average annual global temperature increased by 0.97 Celsius or 1.75 degrees Fahrenheit mentioned to that you that to you earlier right almost two degrees fahrenheit increase in temperature from 1915 to 2015 but if you examine how or when that warming has occurred you would find that most of the warming has occurred just in the past four decades temperature is increasing faster in recent years than for the uh hundred years as a whole okay so if you go back and look at the figure, you see temperature increased somewhat between 1910 or so in the 40s. Then it leveled off for a few decades, and then it increased again. If you want to look at the average net increase between uh, 1900 and now and compare it to how it's increased recently, you'd see its temperatures going up faster in recent years. This warming will continue, and... Uh, the 21st century warming is going to be at least twice as much as what the warming was in this 100 year period from 1915 to 2015. Could be several times more. Now, what are some consequences of global warming besides the obvious increasing temperatures? Well, one is decreasing summer Arctic sea ice extent. Average monthly Arctic sea ice extent has been available 
since 1979. And what happens over the course of a year? Starting in the winter time, yeah, it's very cold in the Arctic, the ice is formed and it stays there. And then in the spring and into the summer, the Arctic sea ice melts. Not all of it melts, thankfully, but some of it melts as temperatures warm above freezing. And typically, over the 12 months of the year, September has the lowest sea ice extent. Okay, it's the end of summer, and ice has melted. And then after what happens after September, October, November, it's getting colder, so the ice reforms. Okay. Now the ice completely reforms in the winter time, but some of it melts in the summer. And what's happening is, as we go forward from the 70s into the 80s into the 90s to now, more of it's melting now than used to. Okay. And this has great consequences. By 2040, Arctic summers could be ice-free. If you want to find the 11 years with the lowest sea ice extents, you'd see that they've all occurred in the last 11 years. 2012 had the uh, lowest September sea ice extent on record, 3.63 million square kilometers. 2007 was the second lowest at about 4.3 million square kilometers. Now the blue line shows you the net trend from 1979 to 2015 for September Arctic sea ice extent. It's very clear. It's decreasing. Okay, it should make sense to you because the planet's warming up and as the Earth warms, you have warmer summers, more of that ice is going to melt. Now, what's interesting is that if you split up the trend between the first couple decades and the last couple, you'll notice quite uh, different uh, trends. From 1979 to 96, there wasn't much of a change on average. Okay, yes, ice extent goes up and down from year to year, right? It's variable. Okay. And it really started dropping, it looks like, in the late 80s, but then it went up again. And in fact, the year at the highest September Arctic sea ice extent was September of 1996, nearly 8 million square kilometers. So if you look at the net trend from 1979 to 96, it was pretty flat. But then look at how it, the trend it has been from 96 to present. If you're going to plot trend line from the 96 to present, it'd be at a more negative slope than the net trend line for the whole period. The ice has been melting faster in recent years. Now, let's say you want to look at um, a visual extent of the area covered by ice. You could look at the ice extent from satellite data. Here's the end of summer 1979. Here's Greenland, here's northern Canada or Canada, here's Alaska, here's Soviet Russia. And uh, you see ice, even at the end of summer 1979, you see most of the Arctic is uh, ocean is covered by ice. Okay. Then look what happened as we went to 2007. Boom. Okay. What happened was Arctic sea ice extent declined from nearly 8 million square kilometers to just over 4 million square kilometers, almost 50 percent, okay? And 2012 is even less. Now, this sea ice extent is very important. The polar bears need sea ice to hunt for whales. As the sea ice extent decreases, they have to swim longer distances, they have less to, uh, access to ice to forage for food, and they're in trouble. What's also happening as this ice melts in the summertime, is that temperatures are increasing faster in the Arctic than for the rest of the world, okay? Remember how from 1915 to 2015, average global temperature increase was 0.97 Celsius, 1.75 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, it was several degrees Fahrenheit in the Arctic. And this can affect the jet stream. That could cause the jet stream to slow down. 
because the jet stream is driven by differences in temperature between the equator and the poles. And if the poles are warming up faster, the difference in temperature between the equator and poles is decreasing. What else is happening due to global warming besides the temperature increase? Well, Mount Kilimanjaro is the only place in Africa covered by snow year-round. Its name translates to sh Shining Mountain. Okay, Ice, snow, it's very bright, very reflective. But in recent years, the amount of snow covering Kilimanjaro has decreased. So here you're looking at a few years going back from the early 1900s to present or near present, showing how the ice is uh, snow cover is declining. Okay, back in 1912, the total area of the snow cover was 12 square kilometers, and only by 1953. Just 41 years later, it was only half of that. Now, as we continued into the late 1900s, into 2000, it just kept decreasing. Now, it might be down to one square kilometer. Sea level is increasing due to global warming. There are two main causes of sea level rise. Number one, melting of continental ice. When we talk about continental ice, we talk about ice on continents. Not sea ice, but continental ice. We are talking about the Antarctic ice sheet, we're talking about the Greenland ice sheet. And as the ice on the edges of those co uh, continents melts, it flows into the ocean and the sea level goes up. The ocean level is also rising due to thermal expansion. As the ocean becomes warmer, what happens to the molecules that make it up? Make it up, they move faster. And so the ocean expands. We're looking at change in sea level from 1880 or so to near now based on tide gauge records. We have a lot of data here shown by these uh, lighter uh, colors of green, red, orange. We have a three-year average shown in black. And in recent years, we had satellite measurements to help us. But if you look at it, you see that by 2000, sea level was 20 centimeters or 7.87 inches higher than it was in 1900. Okay, so sea level went up about eight inches, three quarters of a foot. Uh, sorry, two thirds of a foot from 1900 to 2000. And sea level is projected to rapidly increase in the 21st century. A few, uh, a few years ago, sea level was uh, projected to rise about two to four feet in the 21st century. So think about that. In the 20th century, sea level went up less than one foot. Now it's going to go up twice, two to four feet. But in you might have heard this in the recent months. There's been strong evidence in the climate science community that the sea level rise is going to be at least three feet. It looks like the sea level rise is going to be uh, faster than we had expected. And now it looks like we're locked into at least three feet of sea level rise, maybe six feet. Now that's global sea level rise. That doesn't mean everywhere the sea level goes up three feet. Some places it goes up more. So low-lying coastal communities like the Bay Area, New York, New Orleans, Venice, they are going to have issues, okay, in the future, okay. Um, Florida especially, right, Florida is very low, and you know, it looks, it literally sticks out into the Gulf of Mexico. If you go online, you can look at sea level rise maps, where you can look at, for a certain value of sea level rise, what it will look like in places like San Francisco and New York, okay. Is AT&T Park going to be underwater by the late 21st century? The IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's an organization composed of scientists from around the world that come together to publish what are called summaries for policymakers in order to help 
summarize global warming for those in government that can enact legislation to help combat against it. IPCC says that the warming of the climate science system is unequivocal. In other words, it can't be denied. And we've seen that. Nine of the ten warmest years in the modern meteorological record have occurred in the past 14 years. Okay. Further global warming is already unavoidable due to past human activities, and a major international effort is required to mitigate the impacts. You notice the strong language here, okay? Global warming is going to continue, okay? And we need a major international effort, okay? A very large effort between the nations of the world to help mitigate the impacts. Now here, in the next bullet point, you'll see the connection between humans and the warming world. IPCC says that most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid-20th century is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. So most of the increase in global average temperatures that we've seen since the mid 20th century it's very likely okay there's a very good probability that it's due to the observed increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations such as co2 co2 concentration now is near is above 400 parts per million and it was never above 300 parts per million going back 400, even 800,000 years before the early 1900s. These statements came out of the uh, summary for policymakers from the uh, IPCC in 2007, and there was a new uh, uh, IPCC summary for policymakers released a few years ago that you can also find online that continues to um, show this. If anything, the more recent summary for policymakers put out by the IPCC shows more dramatic changes in our climate, such as a higher sea level rise, a faster melting of the uh, Arctic ice sheets. Because it turns out for the sea level rise and the melting of the ice sheets, climate models that were being run in the 2000s, the decade of the 2000s, and in, uh, into the early 2010s were not simulating the, the uh, uh, decrease in sea ice extent and increase in sea level rise fast enough. It turns out sea level is going up faster and sea ice is declining faster than the models were predicting. So we've had to update the uh, projections because of that. Here's another look at the Keeling curve from 1958 to 2000. Last month's or uh, sorry, May 2016 CO2 concentration at Mauna Loa was a staggering 407.7 parts per million. And this is the highest monthly atmospheric CO2 concentration at Mauna Loa ever, going back to since the observations began in 1958. Okay. It's going up, keeps going up. And it's going to keep going up. Monthly atmospheric CO2 concentration in Mauna Loa increased from 315.71 parts per million in March 1958 to 404.83 parts per million in March 2016, a 28.2% rise in 1958 uh, years. And there were some recent milestones for CO2 involving the 400 parts per million threshold. May 9, 2013, just over three years ago, was the first time ever that daily CO2 concentration at Mauna Loa reached 400 parts per million. I remember uh, teaching global warming that semester and mentioning this in my class near the end of the term. Actually, one of, I, I responded to one of my students who uh, mentioned to that, that to me because it was in the news. You might have heard of this. April 2014 
was the first time that monthly CO2 concentration reached 400 parts per million. So even though CO2 concentration got above 400 parts per million on May 9th, on average, the monthly concentration of CO2 averaged over 31 days of that month, still less than 400 parts per million. But April of 2014 was the first time that, for the month as a whole, CO2 concentration was above 400 parts per million. And guess what? Last year, 2015, was the first year ever, going back to 1958, that for the year as a whole, the average annual CO2 concentration at Mauna Loa was above 400 parts per million. And you can say goodbye to CO2 concentrations below 400 parts per million. Never again will CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa get below, be below 400 parts per million at least for the next few hundred years in all likelihood. Now, according to climate models, the increase will continue during the 21st century. By the year 2100, 84 years from now, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere will be anywhere from 550, best case scenario, to 970 parts per million. And the amounts depend on emission scenarios. We'll be talking more about this later in the course. So I want you to think about that. Going back 400, even 800,000 years before 1950, CO2 concentration was never above 300 parts per million. And by 2100, it will be at least 550 parts per million, nearly double that. But in worst case scenario, it could be near 1,000 parts per million. Two and a half times what it is now. Over three times what it was in almost a million years. Okay. That just shows the dramatic change to how much CO2 is being put in the atmosphere in the last several decades, the past 100, 200 years. And we'll be talking about why CO2 emissions are going up. Here's CO2 concentration in the atmosphere going back to 1750. And, it, and the reason I like to show this is because it shows how... Uh, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, CO2 concentration has changed. And it shows how beginning to, uh, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, or first Industrial Revolution, it was slowly increasing, how it's increased faster in more recent times. We've talked about how temperature has increased faster in the last several decades compared to the 20th into the early 21st century. Well, CO2 concentration is also increasing faster in recent years. So notice, in 1750, around the beginning of the first Industrial Revolution, CO2 concentration was 280 parts per million. And it slowly began increasing. It reached 300 parts per million by the early 1900s. By the time the Mauna Loa measurements began, it was around 315 parts per million. Now, of course, it's above 400 parts per million. Wow. To me, this is a really striking figure, okay? Here is CO2 concentration. Before 1958, going uh, from the ice core data, going back 800,000 years, that's almost a million years ago. Okay? That's 600,000 years before humans existed. Okay? And after 1958, we have the Mauna Loa data, which is uh, more accurate, more precise than the uh, ice core data. Look at the staggering upward trend in CO2 concentration in the recent years, okay? Look at how CO2 concentration was never above 300 parts per million going back 800,000 years, and now look at it, okay? To me, this is just incredible to look at. And, you know, this is the human footprint on uh, climate. So why is CO2 concentration going up? because CO2 emissions are going up. CO2 concentration refers to how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. CO2 emission refers to how much CO2 is being put being put into the atmosphere. Okay? And CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for a long time period. So here's how global worldwide CO2 emissions have changed from 1850 to present. 
from the end of the last second industrial revolution to present. It's increased by about a factor of 35 since then. And I, on a personal note, my dad was born in 1950, and in that year the world was putting 5,000 million metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Now the world's putting about 35 million metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. So in his lifetime, the amount of CO2 carbon dioxide put in the atmosphere as a result of burning fossil fuels for electricity, transportation, making products, heating, has increased by a factor of seven. Okay, Why? Increasing population, increasing economies. The two countries in the world that put the most CO2 in the atmosphere are the U.S. and China. For decades, the U.S. was the top emitting country of CO2. But in 2006, 10 years ago, China overtook the U.S. as the world's largest emitter of CO2. U.S. is still higher in emissions per person or per capita. As of 2012, the average American put 16 tons, 16 times 2,000 pounds of CO2 into the atmosphere each year, whereas the average Chinese person only put 7 tons of CO2 per, per, uh, in the atmosphere. So um, Americans are emitting about twice as much CO2 per person as Chinese people. Even though, if you look at the figure, it looks like China is dramatically more than the U.S. now, okay? It's true, China is now putting about twice as much CO2 in the atmosphere each year as the U.S. as a whole. But you got to remember, China has a population of 1.3 billion, four times what the U.S. population is, at about 330 million or so. And you also notice the dramatic rise in CO2 emissions in China in the 2000s, okay? Compared to the US, where actually our emissions are declining from 2005 to 2012. US carbon dioxide emissions declined, decreased by 11%. And the Obama administration has proposed a 26 to 28% decrease in US CO2 emissions from 2005 to 2025. So in the 20-year period from 2005 to 2025, Obama has actually proposed, he's actually pledged that U.S. will reduce our emissions by 26 to 28 percent, more than a quarter. And we're already on the way. From 2005 to 2012, already emissions dropped by 11 percent. But in China, emissions have just skyrocketed in the 2000s. Why? Their economy is rapidly growing. Their uh, population is rapidly increasing. They're building a lot of coal power plants. But if you're going to look, this data ends a, a, few, a few years ago. China's maybe starting to level off. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Obama and the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, had a meeting and they had some major pledges. And China pledged for the first time ever to peak their emissions. They agreed to peak their carbon dioxide emissions by 2030, but it could be sooner than that. In recent years, just the past few years, China is starting to uh, lay out a lot more renewable energy sources for power generation. They're starting to get away from using coal to generate electricity, starting to look and get more to solar and wind to generate electricity. Why has CO2 emissions increased? Well, population's increasing. If you have more people in the world, you need more electricity in their homes. You need more cars. You need more products for people's lives. The world population only got above a billion in the early 1800s. Okay? And then by the later 1800s, it was above 2 billion. And you see how in the last 100, 150 years, the population has surged. As of 11.21 a.m. July 1st, world population was about 7.33 billion. 
and it will continue increasing as we go forward. By 2050, the world population is going to be anywhere from 10 to 13 billion. And if you have that many more people, what are you going to expect? More CO2 emissions. CO2 or carbon dioxide, we've been talking about it a lot now. We'll be we talking more about it in the semester. It's the most important anthropogenic greenhouse gas. G greenhouse gas, GHG. It's the most important human-induced greenhouse gas for a variety of reasons. It has the highest concentration of all human-induced greenhouse gases. There are others. Can you think of any others you may have heard of? Methane, CH4. can come from landfills, can come from agriculture, can come from burning of natural gas for power generation and heating. Nitrous oxide can come from agricultural sources. Okay, carbon monoxide. Well, out of all the greenhouse gases that humans put into the atmosphere, CO2 has the largest concentration. It also has the largest impact on climate. You'll be looking at radiative forcings later. You can look at all these different various forcing factors, both natural and anthropogenic, and try to see, understand which ones have the largest magnitude on, of a, a effect on climate, which ones have the greatest contribution to global warming. Turns out of all the forcing factors, okay, changes in sunlight, volcanic eruptions, more greenhouse gases, more aerosols. Well, CO2 is the uh, single source, single natural forcing factor that has the largest impact on climate. It has the greatest contribution to the observed global warming. And CO2 lasts in the atmosphere for about 120 years. It's long lasting in the atmosphere. Okay. Some carbon dioxide molecules will last longer, some shorter, but on average it'll be there about 120 years. So the decisions that we make now in terms of emissions will affect climate far into the future. That's why even if we, let's say, stopped increasing emissions, okay, let's say we stopped the increase in emissions, and for, dec for, ye for years to come, CO2 emissions remain constant, remain constant at third globally 35 million metric tons of CO2, that wouldn't be enough. CO2 is entering the atmosphere at a faster rate than it's being removed. We put CO2 into the atmosphere. From what sources? Well, we'll be talking about them on the next slide in more detail. What are some sources of CO2? First, anthropogenic sources. What do humans do that put CO2 into the atmosphere? Electricity generation is the largest source of CO2 emissions. Most of the world's electricity comes from the burning of coal and natural gas in power plants. And when you burn coal and natural gas, it puts CO2 in the atmosphere. CO2 is also emitted when we burn products made from oil for transportation. CO2 is burned, excuse me, CO2 is emitted when we burn uh, materials to make products. We burn oils to make a lot of products in factories, whether it be in U.S. and China, right? Of course, in the U.S., a lot of our products are made in China. Commercial and residential usage at home, as well in businesses, even in schools. Not only are you going to uh, put CO2 in the atmosphere to generate electricity, but you, need, you will burn uh, natural gas, perhaps, to heat the home and business. How you recycle, how you dispose of materials at home and in businesses also affects CO2. Okay. There's agricultural source of CO2. When large scale machinery is used to irrigate the crops, put CO2 in the atmosphere. There's land use change, also known as deforestation. Deforestation is the intentional burning of forests. Okay. And forests can be burned to make room for crops, to make room for uh, structures. Okay, like Walmart, right? Um, and when forests are burned, put CO2 in the atmosphere. 
In recent times, the share of CO2 from land use change has decreased to around 10 to 15 percent. But not that long ago, up to a fifth of the world's CO2 emissions were from land use change. Now, humans aren't the only thing that puts CO2 into the atmosphere. There are natural sources of carbon dioxide as well. Can you think of any natural sources of CO2 into the atmosphere? Okay. Remember, going back 800,000 years, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere have changed. Okay, Before humans were around, before 200, 250,000 years ago, CO2 concentrations might be up to 300 parts per million or as little as 160 parts per million. What natural forcing factors caused CO2 to change? Volcanoes. When a volcano erupts, not only does it put ash, dust in the atmosphere that can reflect sunlight and cool the planet, but volcanoes also put CO2 into the atmosphere. And plants put CO2 in the atmosphere. Recall in the spring and summertime, plants decay and they release carbon dioxide during respiration. So we have some sources of carbon dioxide, some atmospheric sources of carbon dioxide in gray, burning of fossil fuels, volcanoes, burning of plants, respiration, soil decay, deforestation, evaporation of CO2 from the ocean. And we have some sinks of CO2 in red. Sources of CO2 are processes that put it into the atmosphere. Sinks are processes that remove it from the atmosphere. Plants, thankfully, remove CO2 from the atmosphere during photosynthesis. We're very thankful for the plants. We care about them. CO2 concentrations would be much higher without them. And we're thankful for the ocean. The upper ocean absorbs CO2. Okay, CO2 dissolves in the upper ocean. There's plants like phytoplankton in the upper ocean that help take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And marine life can carry the CO2 down into the uh, ocean. You know, without the ocean's ability to absorb CO2, concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere might already be a thousand parts per million. But what's happening is that the amount of CO2 entering the atmosphere from these sources exceeds the amount of CO2 being removed in the sinks, through the sinks. That's why, as a whole, CO2 concentration keeps going up. And until the amount of CO2 entering the atmosphere is less than the amount of CO2 leaving the atmosphere, being removed from it, CO2 concentrations will keep going up. In order to eventually stabilize CO2 concentrations, we need to drastically cut emissions. Not all of the carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere. About half of humanity's CO2 goes into the atmosphere. But about a quarter is absorbed by the land, plants, trees, in photosynthesis. And about a quarter is absorbed by the oceans, thankfully. Now, there's other greenhouse gases put in the atmosphere through anthropogenic means that affect climate, including CH4 or CH4 if you prefer, known as methane, nitrous oxide, which has the chemical formula N2O, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, which are a weak greenhouse gas, but they also uh, have affected the ozone layer. You may have heard of ozone depletion, how the ozone hole has formed over the Antarctica, and that's driven by CFCs that have been released from old refrigerators, from aer uh, aerosol sprays, okay, from cleaning solvents, bubbles and foams. We'll talk a little about the ozone layer in this course, but we, thankfully a good news is that the ozone layer is coming back, it's recovering. Okay, Good story is that uh, thank, due to the Montreal Protocol, the ozone layer is recovering. These, CFs, these uh, substances that are emitting CFCs have been phased out, okay? They're no longer sold in the U.S. Maybe you can buy them on the black market in some places. They're no longer sold in the U.S., okay? And they're being phased out in the rest of the world as well. So um, the CFCs, which were causing the ozone layer to break up, okay? They were breaking the ozone into uh, O2 and O. o. Ozone is O3, okay? And the CFCs were breaking up the ozone, O3 into O and O2, O and O2. 
no longer has the function of the ozone layer. Why do we care about the ozone layer? Why? Because it protects us from harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Okay? The ozone layer absorbs the overwhelming majority of ultraviolet radiation before it reaches the surface. Okay? We know about ultraviolet radiation, right? If you ever look at your uh, lotion, your sun lotion, your sunscreen, it might talk about UVA, UVB uh, uh, protection. Ultraviolet radiation can cause sunburn, it can cause skin cancer, right? If you're, uh, and of course, if you're hot, uh, uh, light in color, you know, you're, uh, you might burn easier, okay? And the ozone layer is coming back. Good story. There's different concentrations, atmospheric lifetimes, and warming potentials for these greenhouse gases. Okay, you know, a single molecule of methane, CH4, has about 25 times the warming effect as a single molecule of carbon dioxide. Think about that. A single molecule of methane has about 25 times the warming effect of a single molecule of carbon dioxide. So you might say, wait a minute, we should care a lot more about the methane. Why isn't methane more important than CO2? For different reasons. One, the concentration is much lower. Remember how CO2 concentration is near 400 parts per million now? Well, methane concentration is only two parts per million. Two parts per million. So there's 200 times as much concentration in the atmosphere as methane. Okay, so one molecule of methane is 25 times strong of a, as strong of a greenhouse fat gas as uh, carbon dioxide, but there's a 200th, 0.5% as much methane in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Not only that, folks, but remember how carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere for 120 years? Methane only lasts 12 years. So methane lasts a tenth of the time, and there's only uh, uh, one 200th as much that's why methane as a whole has a lower impact than green, uh, carbon dioxide. And despite the fact it only lasts 12 years, it's still considered long-lasting, that is methane. These other greenhouse, anthropogenic greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, CFCs, carbon monoxide, sulfur hexafluoride, they last from decades to centuries, and they're well mixed, okay? Now, what about water vapor? You may have heard about water vapor. You know, it's a natural greenhouse gas, okay? It's a greenhouse gas as well, but it's not emitted through uh, anthropogenic means. That's why it's considered a natural greenhouse gas. It's different from the anthropogenic greenhouse gases mentioned previously for a variety of reasons. One, highly variable in concentration. Those other greenhouse gases are well mixed. Wherever you go on Earth, okay, wherever how high up you go in the atmosphere, you're gonna find about, with the exception of very close to the surface, um, where the day-to-day uh, -day effects of CO2 are seen, CO2 concentration is generally around 400 parts per million, okay? It doesn't vary that much. Even close to the ground, Okay, where you have the, the commute hour, you know, effect on CO2, you have the uh, electricity demand effect on CO2, still not going to vary that much. But water vapor varies tremendously. Water vapor can make up anywhere to, from 0 to 5% of the air by volume. Okay? Some places, like deserts, uh, uh, Arctic and Antarctica in uh, winter are very cold, very dry. There's almost no water vapor in the air. Whereas above the uh, equatorial regions in the summertime, there might be four or five percent water vapor in the atmosphere, okay? So it's highly variable in concentration. It's not well mixed, okay? Water is the only substance that can exist as a, a solid, liquid, and a gas at normal atmospheric temperature and pressure. Water is constantly melting, evaporating, freezing, depositing, it's constantly changing phase, okay? And water vapor is the gas state or phase of liquid water. And 
Seventy percent of the uh, atmosphere, uh, uh, Earth is covered by what? Ocean. Okay. So water, vape, water is constantly evaporating off the ocean and, and entering the atmosphere, being added to it. And water vapor is constantly being removed from the atmosphere when it condenses in the clouds. Okay, when it uh, condenses in the clouds, goes back into the ocean too. Okay. And also, it only lasts in the atmosphere for a matter of days. And part of this you can understand if you think about the fact 70% of the ocean, uh, uh, Earth is covered by ocean, and think about how water can be a solid liquid or gas at standard atmospheric temperature and pressure. So it's constantly undergoing phase changes, water that is. That's why water vapor, the gas phase, only lasts in the atmosphere for a matter of days before it's going to condense or uh, deposit. Condense into liquid water, deposit into ice crystals. And the amount present depends on temperature. We were talking about this earlier in the lecture. We were talking about the warmer the temperature, the more water vapor the air can hold. So water vapor, it turns out, is not directly responsible for global warming, but it can amplify the effects of global warming through what are called feedback loops. We'll be talking about the water vapor feedback in this class. And what water vapor can do is enhance the warming. Okay, it can actually increase climate sensitivity. So it, what that means is that a certain increase in carbon dioxide has a greater effect on temperature because of the water vapor uh, feedback loop. We'll be talking about that more in this class.